والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who followed them in righteousness until the end of time. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I trust that everyone had a good Eid. Um, if you celebrated it on Friday, you had the whole weekend to recover. If you did on Saturday, you still had yesterday to recover. But now that Ramadan is over, brothers and sisters, the question is, what happens next? Where do we go from here? Because in Ramadan, we generally had some ideas of what we needed to do. We, know we, we knew we had to fast during the daytime. We knew the things we had to avoid while fasting. We knew the things that we should engage in while fasting. We would come in the evening for Taraweeh. In the last 10 nights, we also came back for PM. But now that all of this is over, what is it we should be doing? Well, first of all, and this is a reminder I know all of you or most of you know uh, of the hadith <laughs> about fasting the six additional days in the month of Shawwal. It is recommended, highly recommended we might say, that a person should also fast six days in Shawwal in addition to Ramadan. These six days, of course, are not compulsory. So if a person chooses not to fast them at all, there is no sin incurred per se. But the Prophet ﷺ has informed us in an authentic hadith. He said, whoever fasts in Ramadan, شوال, then follows it up with six from Shawwal, it would be as if the person has fasted the whole year. So Ramadan, fasting in Ramadan plus the six days in Shawwal would be equivalent in terms of rewards, of course, of having fasted the entire year. So obviously it is a highly recommended and commendable act if a person uh, is so inclined to do it. In fact, we should all try to do it. I know it's much harder to fast out of Ramadan than it is in Ramadan, right? In Ramadan, there is this sort of mentality that we have, mashaAllah. And in fact, Ramadan itself is a special time, a special month. So the feeling we have in Ramadan, which we seem not to have out of Ramadan, there is nothing to be alarmed about because Ramadan is a special time. As the Prophet ﷺ has made clear in the hadith, so we can't or we're not expected to feel the same way after Ramadan as we felt in Ramadan. But nevertheless, we should still try to fast these days for the rewards are tremendous. Again, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us tremendous rewards in, in Ramadan for fasting in as much as fasting is compulsory in Ramadan. So we should make an effort to fast these six days in Shawwal. Because doing that which is not compulsory, doing that which is voluntary, nafil, is an important step in getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith Qudsi in Sahih al-Bukhari, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِأَحَبَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ أَوْ بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ My servant cannot seek to get close to me, to draw near to me, with anything that I love more than the things that are fara'id, the things that I've made compulsory on him or her. So that's where we start. Our starting point in getting closer to Allah is with the fara'id. Then Allah the Exalted says, وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ وَلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ And my servant continues to seek to get closer to me by doing the nawafil, the voluntary things. حَتَّى أُحِبَّ Until 
he reaches a point where I begin to love him. Allah begins to love that individual. Because you see, brothers and sisters, the farm, we may sub, 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 submit to it because we know we have no choice, right? It's sinful not to do it. With the nafil, the voluntary, we know that it's not compulsory and we know that there is no sin in not doing it. And so it takes perhaps a higher level of sacrifice. Because now you don't have to do it. There is no sin if you didn't do it. It will take greater sacrifice now and commitment to still do it. To do what is the duty, what is compulsory, it involves sacrifice as well. But because we understand the sinful nature of not doing what is compulsory, we find it perhaps a lot more easy to, to do what is compulsory. But for the nafil, we don't have the, the sin hanging over our head of not doing it because it's voluntary. So it takes greater commitment and effort from the individual to do it. And that's why the rewards are tremendous. So we should make an effort, inshallah, without you know making it far per se to fast these days. Alhamdulillah, these six days can be done on any six days in the month of Shawwal. They do not have to be consecutive. Like we had to fast consecutively in Ramadan 29, 30 days. These six days can be done <coughs> intermittently, but within the month of Shawwal. So it's time constraint. It can only be done in the month of Shawwal, which will end sometime around the 16th or maybe the 15th of August. So we have, uh, you know, probably 27 days or 26 days left to choose any six and fast them. So what works for you, MashaAllah? I know many people decide to just fast the six consecutively because they're already in the mood from Ramadan and so they do that. There are others who choose uh, to do it Mondays and Thursdays, let's say. All right, and uh, they complete the six. But however you choose to do it, it must be done in the month of Shawwal, because that's what the Prophet ﷺ mentions in the Hadith. min Shawwal. Then he follows that up with six from Shawwal. So that's one thing we can do. The other thing, brothers and sisters, is in as much as Ramadan was a special month with special virtues and blessings, we must remember. That Allah the Exalted is always ever present. He does not go into seclusion or hiding. And in as much as we may have had greater opportunities in Ramadan to draw closer to Allah the Exalted, it does not mean that we don't have similar chances or opportunities after Ramadan. Allah is still there. So we should still make dua. Dua we should still make. We still pray five times a day and we should make our duas. We should still strive to pray our nafil prayers. In fact, now is the time, brothers and sisters, that we get a chance to put into practice the training we received in Ramadan. The training we received. So, all the sunnah and nafil prayers, for example, we used to perform in Ramadan, we should try to continue to do so. We should try to continue to do so. All the good things we used to do, the charities we used to give, the kindness and the compassion and the tolerance, we should continue to be kind and, and, and tolerant and compassionate. These are all qualities that are desirable, that are commendable, whether we're in or out of Ramadan. So we should continue, mashaAllah, to Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do the good things we used to do in the month of Ramadan. We're not expected, of course, to worship Allah at the same level in Ramadan. Because then if we worship Allah throughout the year with the same level of intensity in Ramadan, there will be no difference. But even with the Prophet والسلام, in Ramadan, as Aisha radiallahu anha tells us in the authentic hadith, in the last 10 days he would work even harder. So to work harder means there's something that, that you can notice and you can see in the person's behavior or actions. So even the Prophet ﷺ did not practice at that level or worship Allah at the level where there was no difference between Ramadan and out of Ramadan. 
So we're, of course we're not a, a, a required or expected to perform at the same level, but at the same time, we're not expected to suddenly have turned around, you know, 180 degrees. That nothing from Ramadan continues in our lives and in our behavior after Ramadan. Because in Ramadan, we would have received that training, that practice. That practice that is habit forming. That's why it's 29 or 30 days. And so constantly doing something good over this period of time uh, trains the, 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 the body, trains the mind to do it. So it becomes a lot easier. It becomes more like a habit. So we should continue to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Continue to do the good things we were doing in the month of Ramadan. And we should not forget to ask Allah for His acceptance. Remember, it doesn't matter what we do. Allah is not bound to accept it. We do and we hope that what we do, Allah will accept. But we should also pray for, for acceptance because in praying for acceptance, what we are demonstrating is that element of fear, that little bit of fear that maybe Allah is not pleased with my actions and my deeds. If we don't pray for forgiveness, then the attitude that is manifested here is one of, I have done this and God must accept it or if He doesn't, I don't care. And that's definitely not the attitude that a Muslim should have. We should always have some amount of fear that Allah may not accept what we do. Not so much fear as to inhibit us from doing anything or fear, so much fear to make us uh, disgusted and bored and you know, well, you know, if God is not going to accept it, what's the sense in doing it? No. Just the right amount of fear to motivate us and inspire us to do even more. So we have to maintain a level of balance, a balance between hope and fear. We cannot despair of the mercy of Allah and the acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should not. But at the same time, we should not become complacent and think that whatever good we do, God must accept it. Because there is none who can force Allah the Exalted to accept or not to accept anything. Plus we need to remember that acceptance is based on the level of sincerity that we have in whatever we do. Because it is only with sincerity that Allah is pleased with the deed or the action. And when Allah is pleased, then He will accept. So there is something that you and I can do to increase our chances of acceptance and that is to be sincere, to question our own motives and motivation. But despite all of that, we still don't know for sure whether Allah will accept or not. So we pray for acceptance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us this in the Quran. When he mentioned the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he and Ismail, his son alayhi salam, rebuilt the Kaaba. They did not just rebuild it and expect that Allah will accept this hard work from them. They prayed for acceptance. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'un alim. Our Lord, accept this from us. This, this act, this deed of rebuilding the Kaaba, accept it from us. Innaka anta sami'un alim. For you are the all hearing, the all knowing. And then in the next ayah, they also prayed, Wa tub alayna. Rabbana waj'alna muslimayni lak. They also prayed, they said, O Lord, make us two people. Muslimain who submit and surrender to you. And show us our our rites, our rituals that we have to perform. Alright, they didn't make it up as they went along. They asked Allah to show them. To give them revelation and guidance as to what they should do and how they should do it. And that's why in Islam we don't make up Islam as we go along. We take it from the example of the Prophet and from the Quran. They also prayed for their progeny, their children, you and I. 
ربنا وجعلنا مسلمين لك ومن ذريتنا أمة مسلمة لك. They said, O oh Lord, make us two people who submit and surrender to you, and from our progeny, our children, a, a nation, ummatan muslimatan lak, a nation that will submit to you. That nation is ummati Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The ummah, the nation of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the people who, who are part of this nation are called Muslims, you and I today. So it is a result of their prayer, their dua, many centuries ago. Then they asked Allah to show them their rights, their manasik. وَتُبْ alayna, And turn to us with your forgiveness. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ We should also be thankful and grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know brothers and sisters, often when we talk about being happy, when we break our fast, that is on the day of Eid and the days after. This happiness is not purely merrymaking, celebration and eating and drinking and whatever else. Alhamdulillah, we're allowed to eat and drink and celebrate. But one aspect of this happiness is actually to give gratitude to Allah, to give thanks to Allah for having blessed us with the opportunities to do whatever we have done in the month of Ramadan. Because we could easily have been uh, been ill or sick or traveling or some other thing could have prevented us from doing mashallah what we were able to do in the month of Ramadan so part of this happiness we feel is an expression of gratitude and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should, we, should, we should thank Allah as well for enabling us to fast and for enabling us to do all the good things we were able to do for being able to come to Taraweeh for being able to come back in the night time in the last 10 days for a PM. Because there are so many things that could have gotten in the way to prevent us from doing some or all of these things. So we should also give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, as Allah mentions in Surah al naml when he heard what one ant said to the other ants as he was marching with his army through this valley, he recognized this as a, as a great favor that Allah bestowed upon him. And instantly he was thankful and grateful on the spot. But his expression of gratitude is an interesting one. Because in his expression of gratitude, he asked Allah for three things. He just didn't say Alhamdulillah. Saying Alhamdulillah or MashaAllah, this is good and important. But it's not enough. Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, first, the first thing he prayed when he recognized the fact that he could understand what an ant said to the other ants as a tremendous favor of Allah that he had bestowed upon him. He said, Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkuru ni'matakal lati an'amta alayhi. He said, my Lord, give me the ability, cause me to be able to give thanks to you. What this statement boils down to you boils down to is make me cause me to be able to recognize your favors as favors from you. Because if we cannot recognize a favor from someone, we will see no need to thank the person. You will not say thank you to somebody unless you have realized the person has done something good for you. You don't go about saying thank you to people just like that. People might think you're crazy. But if you recognize they have done something for you, they've held open the door for you, then you thank them. So the key in being thankful is first of all being able to recognize the blessing as a blessing, or else you won't give thanks. So Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, subhanallah, in his dua that he made to express gratitude to Allah, he put it over very eloquently. He, did, he just didn't say, oh Allah, thank you. He said, Oh Allah, give me the ability. Give me that ability. It caused me to be able to recognize your blessings. Because that's the only way we will give thanks. If we recognize the blessings. So that is the key really. To recognize it as the blessings. That you have bestowed upon me and my parents. Again, this is an important message. He recognized that this was not just all his. His parents played a, bit, a major role. And in all of our lives, our parents have played, mashallah, major roles. We must have done a lot of hard work ourselves, of course, but we cannot...
discount what our parents have done for us. Then the second thing he prayed for, same dua, one amala salihan And give me the ability also, O Lord, to do good deeds with which you are pleased. Interesting that he just didn't pray for uh, Allah to guide him to do good deeds, but he prayed for Allah to guide him to do good deeds with which Allah will be pleased. Because that's the key. If Allah is pleased, He will accept. If He's not pleased, it will not be accepted. Despite how much we pray or fast or give charity and so on. So, pleasing Allah is what is key and important. This is part of the intention. We do things in order to earn the pleasure of Allah the Creator. And then finally, He prayed, وَأَدْخِلْنِي بِرَحْمَتِكَ فِي عِبَادِكَ الصَّالِحِينَ And admit me out of your mercy. Not because I deserve it, O oh Lord, you know. I've done all this good. You must, no. Out of your mercy. Out of your mercy and your compassion for me, admit me in the company of your righteous servants. This is a prophet of Allah, subhanAllah, asking Allah to admit him out of his mercy in the company of the righteous. He must have been a righteous man. He's a messenger of Allah. But this is the humility of the prophet. So we should pray for acceptance as well. And we should strive to do the good things we have uh, been doing in Ramadan, mashaAllah. In as much as we're not expected to perform at the same level, we should not slacken to the point where we're, we've stopped, suddenly stopped doing most things. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open our hearts and minds so that, we, so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed from mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to accept our prayers, our siyam, our salah, our qiyam, our ruku, our sujood, our du'as, and all our good deeds in the month of Ramadan. And may He cause us to continue and guide us to continue to do the good things we used to do in Ramadan. May He help us and guide us to continue to seek to get closer to Him by doing the things that are voluntary, they're no longer compulsory, so that we can come near to Him and we can be deserving of receiving His favor and His grace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive for us for our mistakes and shortcomings. May He also make it easy for us to fast our six days in the month of Shawwal. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته